Welcome to the Ocean Tribe Hangout, where we chat with water humans from across the world. We focus on passion, representation, and most importantly, inspiring the world to venture into the most beautiful place, the ocean. Let's tuck in. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's Instagram Live. We're going to be chatting to Weldon Wade tonight, who is a free di- He's a free diver, he's a scuba diver, but he's a guy who also dives with a rebreather. And I know that there are dangers that are associated to, to rebreathers in general. And I thought it would be a phenomenal opportunity for us to have a chat with him. He's also, hi Mavisa, welcome to, welcome to this evening's live. Um, so I thought we could have a chat with him to look into, you know, what, what does a rebreather even mean? So that's one, but also he's one, he's a Paddy Ambassador diver. And I see that he's just joined uh, the live and he has requested. And this is probably going to be the shortest live that we'll ever do. And I don't even know how the hell we're going to do it. Hello! How are you What's doing? going on? How are we with the audio? Are we good? I am, like, I'm so happy to see you. Like, I, I'm always happy seeing you. How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody around the world. I've been watching this platform grow and grow over the last while. And uh, I'm nervous, you guys. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Finally on the live with the Black Mermaid Freediving ZA, the mm. wonderful, the one and only Zandi. So yeah, it's a privilege and an honor, you guys. <laughs> I see that everyone is... Um joining our live thank you everyone for coming through uh this is probably going to be the shortest live i've ever done so i'm a little bit freaked out for time because i want to ask you everything under the sky but okay how's how's the how's the weather in bermuda how's it is it warm is it beautiful the pictures that you always post are a reminder of what heaven should look like and if it doesn't look that way oh I'm my dear well, it's, it's summertime here in Bermuda. Um, if you don't know where Bermuda is, we're uh, just off the east coast of the United States, about, let's say about 700 miles right off the east of the Carolinas. So we're significantly farther, you know, I'd say north of the Caribbean than people may realize. So, you know, we're nowhere near the Bahamas uh, and our, our cousins, you know, to the, to the south. We're sort of the jewel of the Atlantic smack in the middle of the Sargasso Sea, all by ourselves, no one really around us. Um, I think if we go west, we'll get, no, east, we'll get to the Azores. Um, north, I don't know what's north. Um, and south, we'll probably, you know, get to the Bahamas. So, yeah, it's, it's 80 degrees here. I wanted to do this live outside, so you, can, you guys can see for yourselves, whether you're on the live or on the replay. But it's raining. So I said, look, let me, let me do this in the home studio, you know. And um, we can go live some other time from the beach or something like that. So gorgeous. It's humid. Bermuda gets very humid compared to other yeah. islands. So we don't get uber hot, um, you know, like in the hundreds consistently. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm just here, man. I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited for us to, to chat because, I mean, you do like so many things, but yeah. let's, let, let's start it easy. Interestingly enough, we also had rain last night. We've had like very windy weather. But... Mm -hmm. Tell us what is your thing? What is your smile bringer? What is your happiness maker? What is your wake up and shake and bake kind of vibe? What's your thing? My thing is sharing. You know, I just, I just feel there's so much abundance out there and there's so much to see and do when it comes to uh, being in, on, or under the water. So I know, like, for me, what I get most joy out of is like sharing that experience with somebody new. Sharing it with anybody is fine, but it's wonderful to see people that had a fear of the ocean or um, whether or not they're in Bermuda being a, a local or, or, or they're a resident or whatever, you know, once they put that little window over their eyes, they look around and they're in shallow water and they're like, wow, I had no idea what was down here. And I'm like, this is your backyard. Like, 
you know, it's, it's that. And I went through that experience just recently where um, a friend was like, look, I can barely swim, but I really, like, I just see your pictures. I really want to get in the water and see what's underneath the surface. And we did that in a confined area, not too far from where I live. And, um, yeah, now she's like, I want a mask like yours. I want fins like yours. You know, I want to learn how to swim properly, you know, um, and get it, get into the, the pod. And I told her already, I was like, look, you're doing fine. Like, we'll take baby steps. So we, you know, we tried different masks on and we figured, okay, all of that. And it was great because we had a one-on-one -on -one experience. And what I want to share with your viewers is like a lot of people who have a bad introduction to the ocean tend to have that bad taste in their mouth for, for a while. Um, whether or not you were part of a large group that's trying to, that's learning how to do something just to, yeah. today, for example, doing your first scuba dive. If you're on a boat, the seas are rough, it's burning fumes. You're one of 15 people on the boat. Everything's new to you. The briefing is over the running engine. You know, you're feeling nauseous. Um, that's a far cry from one-on-one -on -one instruction with someone that's not rushed, you know, I mean, forget like the kit doesn't fit you properly. You know, you, your mask is flooding. Um, so I would encourage everyone uh, that's, 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 that's listening that um, there's a lot to see out there. And if yeah. you had a bad experience and it sort of fit some of the stuff I, I said, um, it's no fault of anyone's. So that's just how it is sometimes, but give the ocean another shot. She's, she's, she's waiting for you to come back and have a, a more pleasant experience. Um, I, I, I love that so much because you mentioned two things, right? So you mentioned sharing and I can completely like feel that and I vibe with that. And that's part of the reason why I knew I wanted to be a freediving instructor because I wanted to have the opportunity to be able to take people yeah. out and trade yeah. that fear for the love of the ocean. And I think we've had this discussion before. And you're right, yeah. that it's like putting on these little glasses and you're just like, oh my freaking gosh. Yeah. And you change the completely, you know? And, and again, mentioning that like a bad experience can make someone be put off water. I had a student who actually mentioned that you know, he wasn't told to equalize. So he kept on descending and descending and he just felt this pressure, but he didn't know what to do with it. And in the end, the, the, the dive ended with, with, you know, with, with massive discomfort and you kind of stop and, and you always realize that when, when people have always been in the water, some of the basic stuff is skipped in having discussions. It's assumed to be a no. And I am 100% like with you on that. But you have to tell us, have you always been a water baby? How did this, how did this heart thing happen? This uh, in love space happen? Well, my, my first living memory is, is of my father throwing me into the ocean as a toddler. Um, and that's sort of a rite of passage in Bermuda. I don't know how it is in other islands, but that's how we learn how to swim, at least as, as young boys. Um, so while I've had the ocean as my backyard my entire life, except for some time I spent overseas, I didn't really get into ocean advocacy and ocean exploration or, or dive for that matter until it was like, it became a bucket list item for when I did ultimately move to the state. Actually, I moved to Canada. I moved to Toronto, Ontario in Canada. And I was like, look, let me try you know, scuba diving um, as a bucket list item before I left. So that was like 2007. And it was like in that moment, uh, and I'll be brief because it's, I mean, it's not a long story, but at the end of the day, I was like, why am I only, why am I just doing this? You know, uh, this has been my backyard for all this time. I was in my late twenties. Um, again, surrounded by this, um, where some people um, watching me, you know, not have the ocean so close by, or, or maybe I've never had seen the ocean. Um, it's again, been my backyard. You're never more than a mile away from the sea in Bermuda. That's how small it is, like a little fish hook or 21 square miles fish hook shaped little island. Wow. And um, so, yeah, it was, I was kicking myself. I mean, I still have this like underlying regret. Like if I only would have gotten into it earlier, I would have been able to crush so much more. So that's why I work tirelessly now to make up for like the decade plus that I sort of feel like, you know, I kind of missed out on. But, yeah, yeah. I, I think, the, you know, the question always becomes, you know, did you even miss out on it? The I you know, there's, I was chatting to a guy who lives in Cape Town and he said, you know, Zandi, I've lived, um, I've lived so close to the ocean my whole life, but I only got to experience it 
four years ago. And I think it's just the, the, the different things that happen. I got you. I got you. In South Africa. So the, the ocean hasn't always been accessible in its recreational aspect to everybody, more, right. spe more specifically to black and brown people. And mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing how as we are discovering the ocean, we are just like, we're like raging lunatics about this new guy that we found. It's, it's and wild. It feels, and it just feels like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's just insane. Yeah. No doubt. And I know, you know, I think social media and this is, I don't want to digress, but like it, it's doing a lot of good. It's making this happen. Um, we probably would have never met. And yeah. Yeah. You, you know how highly I think of you. So I'm just like, look, with social and being able to connect with the internet and all this you know, innovation and technology, it's really letting, it's opening up a whole new world of community and connection and, and, and sharing knowledge and experiences. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. wicked. I love that. So so you do you do a lot of things, but I want to talk about rebreathers. So rebreathers ah. number one. Everyone talks about how dangerous they are. I know that you mm -hmm. work with a closed circuit rebreather. So one, are there different kinds of rebreathers? And two, has the danger danger? And I put I say mm -hmm. danger in inverted commas because I think with most things it often comes down to being competent competent enough to operate something. So is there a danger when it comes to rebreathers? Why we would use rebreathers? And okay. is there any other way of being in a rebreather other than a closed circuit rebreather? <laughs> I want to do my best to answer those questions, but I want to definitely preface by saying I don't own a rebreather because they're quite expensive. The rebreather that I was certified on is about $12,000 brand new. That doesn't include the training. And, and I want to share with you uh, and, your, and your viewership that my motivation for getting trained on a rebreather, not being an owner as well, was really out of curiosity and interest. Um, in Bermuda, we don't have anything close to what I would consider a thriving closed circuit rebreather or CCR community. Back then, there was probably six active rebreather divers at the time. Um, so the community was quite small, quite tight. So whenever we would get together, um, divers, whether you're snorkeling or, or doing the deep tech stuff, you know, the rebreather divers would always use different words and language and expressions and different things. And I was just like, I don't like being in the room, not understanding what those guys are talking about, because, you know, they're essentially astronauts underwater using this piece of equipment on their back. Um, you know, making it seem probably a little bit more complicated than it is. So I said, listen, there are different units across the world. There's not just one rebreather. They all have the fundamental, fundamentally the same function but there, there are a lot of different models. So you essentially choose the model you want to get certified on. You train on that one specific model. That's the only model that you can fly. And um, I chose a subgravity defender. And I flew to St. Croix, met up with my trainer, instructor, John Kieran, and we spent a week uh, training on the defender. Um, and massive takeaway, <clears throat> because for those of you that, that do scuba diving, you know, buoyancy is a big thing. Um, and making bubbles and being noisy and, um, and those kind of things are kind of par for the course. You can't get away from that. Where with rebreathers, you're not making any bubbles. And so that has a lot of benefit. That's a whole, can be a whole live in of itself. Um, and then your buoyancy is different. Before I did the training, I did a try dive on a rebreather. And as the technology evolves and gets safer, it becomes more accessible. So if you were interested in doing a rebreather dive, you could probably go somewhere that has rebreather try dives and do a try dive. So when I was in Grand Cayman a few years ago, I did a try dive on a specific rebreather called the Inspiration. And I had no problems with buoyancy. And I got about 24 inches away from the largest spotted eagle ray I'd ever seen. Wow. And I was able to have that interaction because I wasn't making any bubbles. I wasn't scaring the thing away. So shout out to all my free divers in, on the live because Obviously, on one breath, you're down at depth, you're interacting with ocean life, but you're limited to your, to your, your breath. CCR gives you a similar experience. Granted, you've got a five-figure, you know, costing piece of equipment on your back instead of your lungs. Um, so, so, yeah, that was the vibe. So that's been about three years now. I miss St. Croix. I haven't seen John in, in a while. But, you know... I encourage you guys to, and I say this a lot, like just be diverse. 
I know a lot of us like to silo ourselves in specific dive disciplines. Yeah. Um, and no pun intended, but just be diverse. Like snorkel, free dive, scuba dive, jump on a CCR if you can, do some commercial yeah. stuff if you can, just to build up your, your experience. So I'll probably never own a rebreather in my, in my lifetime, but should the opportunity arise, I can always cross over to a different model, like the Hollis Prism 2, for example. That's a popular unit, and I can just do a crossover course. I've got what's called, what's called Mod 1. So I've got the level one, which means I can dive a certain certain depth for so long. Um, so I could do a crossover to the prism, and maybe I'll get a prism. Like I, I don't know. I just love the knowledge, and that's a big thing. Like just having that. Knowledge. Yeah. I think um, what's what's I think for me the one thing when I think about rebreathers is like you already said that they cost a lot, which yeah. which already classifies the people who will be able to go into the rebreather space but also yeah. the training for it and the fact that you are you you aren't just trained for all rebreathers you're trained for one so you need to pick your inspiration or your hollis and you and you commit to that and if you're going to be yeah. moving across it's another 15,000 or 20,000 which is a lot of money because and that kind yeah. of creates it creates a little class of its own when it comes to scuba diving and i definitely do agree you know to to explore as much as you can and i think for me the rebreather space i kind of look at it with a different respect it's like whoa that looks nice it's, from afar yeah you know? yeah it's 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 cool and and and, and again um, a rebreather is essentially a piece of equipment that will take the metabolized you know oxygen uh, out of your exhaled breath um, and take the CO2 out of your loop. You're actually on a, on a closed loop. So if you've got yeah. time, you want to learn exactly how they work, just feel free to look it up. But essentially, you're not bound by the one tank on your back. You've got two tanks, yeah. one filled with air, one filled with, I'm sorry, oxygen and diluent. Typically, it's air. And as you inhale, you're breathing gas. Your body metabolizes that. You exhale, and it goes to a scrubber, which is softener lime, and that the CO2 gets absorbed into the softener lime and goes back yeah. to the loop and you breathe, breathe your air. And that's how you're yeah. able to not make any bubbles, pretty much. Yeah. And so the, the rebreather space came into view for me. So as a scuba diver, I had never okay. paid for that. But my, okay. diving buddy, my diving buddy wanted to go see coelacanths. So a coelacanth is this old fish. I don't want to... I don't want to overcommit to knowing much about the coelacanth, but, <laughs> but it's found in Sodwana Bay and apparently it is eons and eons and eons old and, but it can only be found at a hundred meters of depth. So at around a hundred meters. So you would, you would need a, a rebreather. You would need a trimix. You would need all of those things. And yeah. That's when I went into certing my, certifying myself a little bit deeper. But somewhere along the way, I said, you know, I realized that it could take us maybe 10 to 15 minutes to descend, but it would take us forever to get back up from a 100 meter uh, dive mm. just because of um, degassing and all of that. And I just said, how's about I just become a really good feeder? <laughs> so, how, how's, about, how's about I really get my, get, get my, shit together and free yep. dive to 100 meters so i'll meet you there and then Goodness. We'll have a quick squeeze and then i swim back up and i'll wait while you take six hours to get back to the top Sheesh. because it takes forever which is interesting it, it is it is um rebreathers scuba equipment all that stuff it's it's their tools right they're tools for us to achieve something um, whether or not you want to get to a specific depth to seize a, an organism or you're doing some benthic coral work and you need to get down to 100 meters, 300 feet or whatever, you got to decide, you know, that's the mission. Do we use open circuit and, and boost a bunch of tanks all night? And, and different countries and different regions will have different facilities. So if you're in cave country in Florida, getting that stuff done is easy. If you're in an island like Bermuda and you want to do a trimix blend, you're, you're, you're going to have some, some issues. Um, and then you say, no, open circuit just costs too much. It's helium and all kinds of fancy business. You're like, look, let's find the budget to, to train on rebreathers. And that way it's just, it's a better tool. Right now, all the technical diving expeditions that I'm aware of, 
that would have gone to open circuit, traditional, you exhale, there's bubbles diving, um, they're no longer doing that. Whether it's cave diving, um, deep penetration okay. diving, you know, uh, wreck diving, like in truck lagoon or anything like that, the cave stuff, they're, they're either on CCR. And right now you've got side mount rebreathers now, so you can get through those tight spots. Um, it, it's, it's definitely worth it when you compare open circuit to closed. Um, yeah. But I totally feel you on like, let me take, you know, take on free diving and crush that and maybe come back to CCR some other time. I think once you try it, you know, once you, once you try it, and even if you were to get mod one, you know, like me, you don't have to own it. It's just a matter yeah. of when, so for me, when it kind of goes back to, to the story, when we're in the room together and somebody says, Ooh, what about rebreathers? I can raise my hand and say, look, I'm the only Bermudian certified across all disciplines. And they're like, and that way, you know, and I, I say this tongue in cheek to my CCR colleagues here, it's like, I can't be sort of fooled by the whole thing about them being more complex than they are. Are they dangerous? Crossing the street is, is, is dangerous. You yeah. can get hypoxia, um, you know, things can happen with the loop. Um, you can look up CCR fatalities and deaths and all that um, online, and it, it happens. Bermuda has even experienced um, two fatalities on rebreather, and that's what set the community building back. And again, I think that's probably better for another live. But um, yeah. part of learning um, about it was to, you know, be an advocate for it. We're talking about it now. We've been talking about it, you know, for the last while, and I think it's important um, and valuable to have this knowledge to share with the community to say, look, the technology has evolved and it continues to evolve. It's not a big, scary death box like they probably were perceived to be at some stage. You've got to do your patty open water tomorrow. And I believe your, your patty book has a rebreather in that. And I know some divers, two of them specifically, they skipped the standard aluminum tank open circuit track completely and went straight to CCR. So we're in 2020 and brand new divers are going straight to closed circuit. Um, and that's a real thing. Whereas 10 years ago, I would have said, no way, open circuit so, before you go. So, so hold on. I, you, oh, you are, you are moving around there a little bit. We're a little bit static. Can you hear okay, me? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, awesome. Tell us about, um, so I think the rebreather space is like super intense. And I think if people are looking into it, there's such an important educational aspect to it, just like with everything else that you'll do. So I want to jump on to, you do a lot of conservation work and you need to tell me if you're able to extend a little bit or if you need to run. So at any point, but let's just keep going for now. I, I applaud the amount of conservation work that you do. You started Guardians of the Reef. Tell us about that. What do you do there? I think it's important to preface the whole um, the representation thing. I think that you and, and your, your, your platforms and your message has a lot to do with representation. And, and that's what kind of got me, you know, 10 years ago to, tr to transition, I guess, from let me completely, you know, be an awesome diver to, you know, let me... Um, figure out why there aren't more Bermudians in, in the space and try to create a, a platform for me to just keep divers, get divers involved in diving and keep them engaged. So I started an, an organization called Guardians of the Reef and the name sort of speaks for itself. Whether you, if you don't dive, that's okay. If you snorkel, free dive, scuba dive, you know, bring yourself and your equipment uh, to a beach or to a bay or to the boat and we'll get out there and use citizen science uh, to, to do our, our best to protect the ocean, whether that's uh, hunting invasive species or picking up marine debris from the bottom of the ocean. That's sort of the, the big driver. Since most of the debris, that, the debris that enters the ocean doesn't float, um, it's at the bottom. So you use your diving skills, you grab an onion sack, you dive down to the bottom, pick up the bottles and plastic bits and bobs that you find and you dispose of that, that properly. So that was, you know, representation essentially was a cornerstone to like, you know, if they were Bermudians, especially Bermudians that look like us already diving and super active, then there wouldn't have been a need for me to even do something like this. But yeah. there was a need 10 years ago, and there's still a need now to keep divers diving, uh, you know, get new divers in the water and just keep, keep, keep people engaged. 
Um, yeah. There's a certain point, you know, I feel where, particularly in scuba diving, you know, you, you dive a wreck, you dive a reef. That's great. I call that, you know, underwater sightseeing. When you're taking pictures and leaving nothing but bubbles, that's all fine. But sometimes I think at a point comes where you're like, look, it cost me $130 US to do these outings with these dive shops or cost me money to get the kit and then do shore dives with friends. You want to do a little bit, something more purposeful. So the whole diving with a purpose thing evolves with like, oh, you guys, you know, let's grab a spear, grab some onion sacks, pick up trash that's on the bottom and have a little bit more of a story to tell when you're like, hey, how was your dive? You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We hooked up, made some new friends, picked up some trash, called some invasive species and had a good time, had some swizzle and swizzle and chili and whatnot <laughs> afterwards, listened to some soca and some reggae and, you know, it was a vibe. So that's what I kind of, I travel across the island and I've done some stuff overseas, just creating a vibe and just having a good time versus sort yeah. of the cookie cutter, you know, meet at the shop, take the boat out, do the two dives, come back and, and, and off you go, you know? No disrespect yeah. to my local dive shop owners and those guys. But my, so, my, my, my outings tend to be a lot more fun. So uh, I love everything that you've just said. You know, Guardians of the Reef talking to everybody who loves the ocean. I think in my, in my last newsletter or the newsletter that's coming up, I chat about whether you are an ocean lover in that you surf it, you scuba it, you free it, you paddle it, you like looking at it from, you know, whether you like to sit on the beach and stare at it and you love the air around the space. We all, you know, or whether you're still reading about it and you're still dreaming mm -hmm. about it, we can still create a community because we're all coming to this beautiful space where we church in our different ways. And I just love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving from passion to purpose, you know, when you talk about citizen science, I'm touched by that yep. because, you know, our ability to be able to learn while we, you know, our ability to be able to learn is just as important and to do something purposeful with ourselves, whether we're picking up debris in the ocean, it's such an amazing thing. And I see that uh, Shanti. Hi, Shanti. And she's like, power cut tried to stop me, but I'm here now. Girl, this load shedding has been having us. So I'm glad that you're able to join our chat. Shanti's in, where, where are you, Shanti? Just, where are you at? You're, you're in South Africa as well? I think Shanti is in, yeah, let, let, let's have her type it in. But I, I love that you've started Guardians of the Reef. Do Bermudian yep. dive. Tell me that. So I know that in South Africa, as so we've got um, like oh there Shanti Kenya. Kenya. <laughs> no, no, no! I'm gonna do something real quick because I like doing this. Uh, don't let me cut you off. You know, carry on. Uh, are you looking up where Kenya is and the beautiful no. diving? Diving no. in Kenya is beautiful. L let me tell no. you that. At least that's from the images that I've seen. But yeah. So. Yeah, go do ahead. Bermud do Bermudians dive? Tell you have to tell me that. So you say that you live on this small island. You uh -huh. are pretty much surrounded by water. Are uh -huh. Bermudians big divers? Is there a big dive culture now that you are around the water? That's a good question. And my answer will be yes, Bermudians do dive. It just, you just kind of got to look for us. That's probably the best way for me to put it. Um, and shout out to Kenya. Kenya is 11,189 kilometers from Bermuda. That's what I was looking up. That's a, that's a long way. Um, so when I first started scuba diving and I'm looking around at the local dive shops, the, the, the businesses that operate here that will take people diving, then and now, if you were to sit at these dive shops and look at the people coming in through the doors, they, you know, pre-pandemic, would typically be tourists and, and residents that are non-Bermudian. If you were to judge, um, do Bermudians dive, or ask that question from that lens, you'd say, wow, Bermudians don't, don't free dive, don't scuba dive, don't swim, don't do anything. Just because you won't see them passing through the local dive shops. It's when you figure out, okay, let me look at other, um, other hotspots. Then, yeah, we sail, we swim, we love the beach. There are numerous beaches and bays around the island. Um, so I think, you know, on one hand, some may say Bermudians don't, 
don't dive, um, don't scuba dive as much. And that's probably true, but that's not, that wasn't the question. Um, do yeah. Bermudians free dive? Okay, here's, here's the thing. This is what's fun. So Bermuda has a decent sized recreational spear fishing and lobstering community. Let's say right now there are about I don't know, 700 people that get their permits to, to harvest um, from the sea. And that's just a, a rough figure. To harvest lobsters and to spearfish in Bermuda, you can't do that on scuba. So yeah. you have to be a free diver to be a lobster, a lobster or, or a spear fisherman or lobster fisherman um, recreationally. So when you think about that, you're like, okay, well, once upon a time, there were like a thousand people getting these permits. Yeah, they wouldn't go with the local dive shop scuba diving because you can't harvest from the sea on scuba here except for invasive lionfish. Everybody else, you've got this, you know, this growing community of people that want to hunt lobsters. So those people are free diving. Do they call themselves free divers? Or do I call no. myself a free diver when I'm harvesting lobsters? Not necessarily, but I'm yeah. taking one breath and I'm diving down to catch these lobsters. So the season is September yeah. through March. So the season just yeah. kicked in. You guys got out on the first, and you're allowed two per day per diver per permit. You pay $130 US, and she runs for those few months, and you know, you're good to go. So Bermudians dive. Like we, we do dive, but we'll do it privately. We'll do it on our own. We'll go from the beach. Now we've got this invasive lionfish thing that started um, like around the year 2000. And that's giving people more of a purpose to train to be a better free diver and get into scuba diving because then they're like, we can eat these invasive lionfish. Let me invest in the gear on the training and I can go home and bring, you know, fresh, sustainable dinner um, home to my family. So while it's terrible, we've got this invasion, which is a whole nother live. Um, it's giving divers more of a purpose. So you've got people that are like, yeah, I'm in Bermuda and it's warm most of the time. So let me learn how to free dive or scuba dive to call invasive lionfish. So yeah, Bermudians dive, man, we dive. We're awesome. So, so you touched on two things that I want to just step on. So we, we, we know that from, you know, and I love that you answered the question the way that you did, because it kind of says, you know, in the traditional sense, before there was coining of terms, were Bermudians in the water. So we've always been diving before it was kind of bracketed as scuba or free diving or whatever yep. else that you would imagine. But scuba diving is obviously a large tourist um, attraction, especially as well when you it come is. to places like Bermuda. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I often tell a story that says I have never been in South Africa. So I've never been scuba diving on a boat when I've seen another black person on the boat. So except for the skipper and maybe our dive master, so the people who are traveling to come and dive on our side, it's, it's, still, it's still a growing space. It's still very little. And again, you know, you might say we have fishermen and we have spear fishermen who have been in the water, but how is that translating into scuba and into the tourism space and into the travel space? So oh. when, I, when you then say that, um, you know, it, would you see Bermudians on a scuba diving trip? Not really. That I always find that intriguing because it, for me, it opens up a new narrative and it says, is it accessible to everybody? Could it be too expensive? Is it something that is not viewed as, I don't, I don't know, there, there's, for me, there's multiple questions. Mm. It says, you know, scuba diving should be for everybody, especially if you're living around that water. And why are Bermudians not necessarily the first people that are stepping into the dive shops to go on a scuba trip well we've already touched on the the fact that well we definitely we, we established rebreathers are expensive but just scuba diving if you and i were to go on a trip right now it's just expensive and um you know you're you're, you're unable to really you you can hunt lionfish but the chances of catching one are rare if, if you want to I'm not saying that diving, there has to be like a take situation. I think first and foremost, um, it's expensive to go on an outing. The dive shops, whether you're in Bermuda or other diving destinations, you may or may not be going back to the same spots. Um, and then, yeah, there are issues with being on the boat and nobody else looks like you. 
Now, whether you're, you're, it's a race thing or an age thing. I've been on boats where there's been one uh, young person on the boat, young, I mean, I'm 42. So if you're, I, I mean, I just remember being on a boat and there was this, this young girl on deck. She had to have been about 15 and um, nobody really paid attention to her. And, mm -hmm. and I looked at her and I was just, I was studying the, this particular situation and I was thinking, if I was her age, would I feel welcome to come back again? Now, her, 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 her barrier or restrictor may not be money. Not every, yeah. you know, some people are doing okay. And money yeah. is not the, the, the barrier in that sense. Yeah. But if I find that when I participate in a certain activity and yeah. I don't feel like welcomed, even though yeah. people say, well, it's not about the experience on the boat, it's the experience on the water. It's kind of like, well, if, if you're on a boat for 40 minutes each way, you know, that your commute is about, about an hour and the whole time nobody's even talking to you or you get the occasional little like, you okay, you know. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I've evolved as a diver and I don't go, to, I, don't, I don't dive with the local dive shops here in Bermuda as much as I used to. Why? Because yeah. I bought a boat. I bought my own boat. I have all my own I gear. Know. I love that. So, so you come to Bermuda tomorrow, we would dive with all the dive shops, you can meet everybody, see how all that works and whatnot, but then we're going out on my boat to go to spots where we can stay as long as we want, as short as we want, um, and do whatever we want, you know, so again, you know, look, going to the shops and using that, you know, putting your finger on the pulse of the diving community from that type of ocean. One sec. You're spinning. Okay. We've got the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science. A lot of young kids down there doing some awesome stuff. We've got the Bermuda Aquarium Museum and Zoo. Lots of people doing awesome stuff there. Um, so there's divers everywhere. Yeah. And, and so I actually missed a little bit of that last minute of audio. It was a little bit scratchy. You mentioned okay. Bermuda Ocean Science doing stuff to, to bridge the gap. No, we, we've got we've got we've got some amazing we've got some amazing institutions here. Do, do you want to repeat that last minute of what you were saying? Yeah, I'm trying to. Now I'm trying to rephrase. I, I just think that we've got the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science, which has a large collection of of scientific divers that do amazing work there. We've also got the Bermuda Aquarium Museum and Zoo, which have a lot of scientific divers and a lot of awesome ocean people, you know, over there as well. So you got to look in the right places, you know, to, to really find the thriving community. We've got the, the True Bermuda team jumped on the live. They might still be on True Bermuda. Uh, Joshua Crockwell is, a, is an amazing freediver. He's spearfishing and bringing up fish, you know, as, as big as us. Um, so it's a, an, an Irish, I see Irish jumped on earlier as well. So when I told you the story about meeting a friend at a cove and sort of introducing her into diving, that's 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 her right there. I don't know if she's still on, but wow. hey, Irish, I told the story. Thank you for jumping on on board. So seeing her, you know, seeing her eyes underwater and her grow in the sport is amazing. Yeah. But yeah, Bermudians do dive. And I love that, right? And I and I know that you do works. You you do some working in schools as well, which I've also started to do. So having conversation with having conversations with kids in school about the ocean and everything that lives in the ocean and just the beauty to explore because yeah. you know i was again saying today that when i was in school the ocean was never mentioned like yeah we we had geography and we had these different subjects but no one ever spoke about the ocean as a place where i should go explore and hmm. that for me was a big self-starter to say i want to go to every school that will listen and now i'm having chats at their career days to say have you considered looking to the ocean have you considered exploring her, you know, be it recreationally or be it um, in hope to, you know, we always hope that when you dive in, you fall in love and you never ever want to leave, which is what you can always bet on that with the sea. And, and I love that because as you speak about this 15 year old girl, I love that we are now looking to grow that space where there's going to be more and more representation. Yeah. And I mean, I think this remains yeah. the, the big thing in these conversations, 
representation and yeah. who's on the boat and how do we increase the people that are on the boat and increase the level of experience that comes with everyone who's on the boat which is phenomenal and i love that and hold yeah. on so i w- i wanted to chat about permits but i feel like we 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 are definitely running over time because you no, know we're, we're fine i got you i got oh, you for the whole hour so i want to chat about permits so i find you know in order to spear fish you need to get a permit and i love the idea of kevin thank you for for that love i see it's there on the on the screen um i think permits are an interesting thing so you're saying that okay. your permit probably costs just over $100 mm-hmm. but again for me it stops to say you know what was what You know what I'm going to actually park the permits. Tell us about your petty ambassador diver. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to uh, in, in my head I'm like I want to talk about representation and I want to talk about diversifying the space and I want to talk about yeah. the idea of affordability for these permits. So who okay. uh, you know how how do we dictate you know this is someone's sustenance and at a point this ocean belongs to them as well. So the question <clears throat> you know mm-hmm. when you start to put a price to play and the price is not to just play the price is to put something on your plate at night for your family how's that working out and how does that wow. become inclusive and you know it's it, it's an interesting thing and i often say you know i might not mind paying for my permits for spear fishing but is there anyone else who's maybe not able to pay mm-hmm. for this permit and finds themselves on the wrong side of of the law And okay. I, often talk, I often talk about our laws in the ending up making criminals of people who are not criminals right. but people who are just trying to put something on their plates. I think it's a uh, these are things I think about. <laughs> well, we might need more time. We might go over over time and have to come back on we'll see. So, it's a couple of things I I took I took some notes. I just wanted to touch on real quick that uh Bermuda is the shipwreck capital of the Atlantic. You know, we were colonized originally in 1609. A ship Okay, whenever I pause, it's because you paused. <laughs> you had the circle. Cool. Oh, let's let it catch itself. I I I I did have the circle. Okay. Let's let it catch itself real quick. Um so yeah, Bermuda shipper capital of the Atlantic. colonized by shipwreck Sir George Somers back in 1609 and yeah so we're taught just to to your, to your early point you know we're taught about the ocean um early on and then our ocean institutions do have a bit of um penetration into the local schools so as a young kid before you can talk you've gone to the aquarium you've seen you know you've seen what Bermuda's ocean sort of has going on and then you know you maybe do a swim class and get snorkeling and that stuff so accessibility you know isn't really an issue especially when the beach is no more than a mile away whether it's you know beach parties with family when you're a kid or with friends when you're older the oceans there and it's it's cool affordability and the permit stuff it's it's interesting because with the work I do with the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity program the blue economy is a big piece food security is a big piece again Bermuda is a really, really tiny island 12,000 acres of land we import most of everything we have we don't really produce anything on island um you know we're surrounded by the sea but then we import you know 80 80% or more of the seafood that we consume here because it's 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 cheaper to import a box of wahoo than to get out and fish you know labor and fuel and running your boat and what not um it's expensive So um you know you pay your 130 dollars US to spearfish um but then you can't spearfish within a mile of shore. Wow. So what that means is if you are a lone spearfisherman you got to find a buddy because you don't want to dive alone. And then you need to get a mile out and you can't swim a mile out because if you swim a mile out and you catch a fish and you're swimming back in you can't prove to the warden that you caught the fish a mile out. So you need a boat. Um so if lobstering is something you want to get into, yeah, you pay the same fee. So if you want to do both, you pay twice. Um you know, you need a buddy and then you go off the um the area that's allowed 
and you hopefully catch some lobsters, but you're going to need mass snorkel fins, noose, wetsuit, bag, light, you know. So I'll be, I'll be, be frank in saying that, and you can't sell what you catch either. Um, that's another thing. Yeah. All the guys that I, that I dabble in, in the ocean with that will harvest from the sea, um, you know, when it comes to providing for your families, it's not, it's not at that level. You know, this is yeah. all for recreation. It's all for fun. It's competitive. It's a good time. But my family is, is going to eat no matter what I catch. And, you know, every day is a fishing day, but not every day is a catching day. So I just wanted to kind of frame that in a sense of like, in Bermuda at least, um, and I know this doesn't apply to all countries. Certainly I've been to countries where commercial fishermen, you know, to, to keep my life on, I have to provide for my family. I can't speak through the lens of a commercial fisherman. I am a commercial fisherman, but I'm species specific. And it's not, it doesn't make up more than, um, you know, 80% of my income. It makes up a very small fraction of my income. Wow. So I can't speak from, you know, fishing is all I know and fishing is all I do. And I'm not going to try to, you know, speak from that particular um, speak to that lens, but you know, the, I, yeah. I, I, I think that's a, that's an interesting perspective. You know, when you kind of stop to say, but hold on, you know, let's take a step back. If you're going to go spear fishing, it costs you more to actually go out than to just buy something from the shop. And I think it's actually insane that, you know, almost all <laughs> your 80% of your seafood is exported. Like wait, why? It's important. It's important. Import yeah. It's important. It's important. Yeah. I can't fathom that. And Shanti is out here saying your, your, your school system sounds like a dream. It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, you know, like anything else, it's got, it's got some work to do. But at the end of the day, if you're not getting in the water or learning about the water on your, on, you know, through school, grab some friends and, uh, and go to the beach on your own. It's, it's always super close. Like Admiralty Park and Clarence Cove, it's probably a 12-minute walk from here. So just That's the accessibility... Amazing. And, and, and again, people from the outside looking in would think island nation, everybody must dive, everybody must fish, everybody must have a boat, everybody must sail, everybody must scuba dive. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work out that way. And for me, you know, I was one of many that just took it for granted. You know, you're going to school on the bus. I'm a, you know, I'm a teenager or whatever. I'm going to school, going to high school. The bus is going across this causeway, which is just a two lane strip that connects one little piece to the next. This, the most beautiful blue, turquoise, green water you've ever seen. But I grew up with this. I see this every day. I'm just like, you're not even, you're, you're talking to each other. You're not even, you don't care. Like, you're not even looking at the water, you know? Whereas now, I've been sort of um, initiated into this ocean thing. Like, I'm, I'm almost crashing into people because I'm, like, driving and I'm looking. I'm like, wow, the water's so clear. I wonder what the visibility's like. I wonder if there's any lionfish over there. I wonder if there's trash I need to pick up. So, like, once you get switched on, it's just this amazing transformation. And um, for me, that didn't happen until scuba diving. And I think, you know, yeah. it affects you at some point in your life in some way, or, or it doesn't. You know what I mean? Like, some people will, will walk the beach, and the beach, they'll have, like, glow sticks and bottle caps and plastic debris all in the, you know, washed up to the high tide line, and people will walk and may not see it at all. Whereas yeah. when I walk the beach and I see trash, I'm like picking up every piece and then I'm organizing a cleanup and then I'm, yeah. you know, complaining about yeah. different things, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. I actually wanted to see, I see Mavisa saying, great chat, guys. i got to head out. Thank you so much for joining us. But I wanted to ask you, so hold on. This, this is where I want us to go as our close. You okay. are an ambassador diver for Patty. Yep which yep. I think is a phenomenal thing. I mean, I celebrate you. We've had this discussion before and I said, wow, that's phenomenal. Patty is massive. They are, you know, they are scuba diving to a large extent. How, tell us about it. Like, I celebrate you and I celebrate that. Wow. Tell us about yeah. it. I, I'm still taking it in, to be honest with you. I think when, um, when I, no, I, I don't think I know because I saw it recently, when I got the message from Patty, so Patty are their professional association of diving instructors. They're the largest like diving training agency in the world, like 8 million people or something like that. So they, are they start, yeah, like that's it. You think of scuba, you think of different agencies, but Patty is front of mind, right? So they started this ambassador diver program probably a few years ago. And it's a situation where you, they had it set up then where you, you apply 
you know, if you really love the message, you love the brand, the agency, the business, what they do and whatnot, you apply and they pick from the list of applicants, their cohort for the year. So I remember I applied probably, I want to say four years ago for the first time. And like anything, you apply and you either make it or you don't. You're selected, right? And um, I applied every year, you know, and it wasn't, it was just a case of, I really want to, you know, let Patty know, it's, it's a two-way thing. Let the organization know the work myself and my team are doing here on, on the island uh, in Bermuda. And by being part of the ambassador, you know, cohort, there's so many wonderful things we could do um, with that relationship. Um, and I know that it was the end of the year, you know, end of last year, 2019, and the first email that I got from, from Patty was that I did not make the cut for the 2020. And then four days later, they were like, welcome to the, welcome to the team. And I was just like, this is the best news I've had in a long time. I was, um, I was really <laughs> emotional because, you know, my, my introduction to Scuba back in 2007-ish was, you know, through Patty. Um, I'm not an instructor, you guys. And I wanted to say this earlier in, in this. Um, right? So I think we'll probably cover it now is that like, I'm not an instructor. Um, my career isn't in ocean stuff at all. I'm, I'm an IT guy. And um, what I've done is I've transitioned from a career in innovation and technology to a full-time career in, in the ocean space through communications and outreach. And it's something I prayed for for a really, really long time. So you don't have to sort of be, to be what you wanna be, you can get to it whichever way. You know? and, and I also never went to college or university. I started my own business right out of high school and I've been sort of, you know, an entrepreneur before it was cool to be an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, I just wanted to get that out there that like, there's really nothing standing in your way except you. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, to, to, to be part of the 2020 ambassador of a cohort is really, really amazing. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that's disappointing, not just Patty and the ambassador is, is, you know, we had so many things lined up and then we've got the global pandemic that we're living through so pretty much from march through now we're just like how does the diving industry as a whole like pivot to um to to to, to continue to just to be yeah you know so you know we're doing our best we're really pushing a dive local campaign um, I really want to put Bermuda on the map because Bermuda tends to be overlooked as a diving destination. So one of my goals, you know, is to um, use this platform to just yeah. say, look, Bermuda is open for business. Yeah. We've got some of the most aggressive COVID testing in the world. Um, wow. Our dive shops are open as, as much as they can be, though it's, re yeah. you know, it's restrictive. And um, yeah, like just come for me and dive. And if the dive shops are closed or they're too busy, like call me and you know I'll take the boat out. And we'll go do so, so, so this was my opportunity to declare that uh, before you and I started talking, I still like believed, not believed, but the stories of the Bermuda Triangle and yeah. the airplanes that disappear in the yeah. space and it's this real. and this and that. You know, when, when you and I started connecting, I was like, oh, so there are people who actually make it to the island and who live yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you, you go around it or you go over it or you go under it, you know, but, you know, things still happen. People still go missing. I think I had a cousin that went missing just the other day, but it happens so often. You're just like, Oh, so and so is missing. Ah, uh, you know, it was a sea monster or you know some. I don't know. So you know, come to Bermuda. Be careful. Go over it. it. <laughs> Go over it. I I I think it's awesome though. And I mean, you know, when I look at Patty, and I know that Patty has been communicating a lot through this time to say, you know, how do we work around this pandemic in order to ensure that people still get out and get into the water? So I celebrate you being part of their ambassador because I think that's phenomenal. And the one Thank thing you. that we've learned, from, we've learned from this year is that, you know, some things are gonna happen in the midst of, you know, our celebrations, like now, you know, there were plans right. and everything had to yep. kind of be parked in the midst of this yep. uh, COVID space. But, you know, I love that you are, again, sharing the message that Bermuda is open, y'all come, you know, y'all come through. And again, yep. you know, the biggest thing about diving locally I love that so much because one, it goes back to our carbon dioxide, our 
carbon dioxide emissions. It talks about travel. It talks about how we become lighter on the earth. You know, we want to travel, but I think we also want to sit, we want to start supporting our businesses that are local because most of the dive businesses also took quite a knock during oh, yeah. COVID, which, oh, yeah. which is a massive thing. And I think if we have an opportunity to support our local businesses, we should help them get back on their feet. And yeah. when they get back on their feet, then we can start traveling the globe again. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, the industry here is, it's, it's seasonal. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just really trying to get as many people together and out on the water as much as possible. If not through the dive shops, you know, just dive, dive local with your friends on your boat and, and whatnot. Like, yeah. But so it, you know, clearly if you're gonna hunt lobsters and spearfish, you, you're not gonna go out with the dive shops. But if you wanna experience yeah. scuba and see some of the healthiest reef in the region and explore some of the, some of the best shipwrecks, shipwreck capital of the Atlantic, for me, there's the place um, mm -hmm. to come and visit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we could visit, we can visit a, a different shipwreck every day for, for a long time. It's quite nice. Yeah. That's freaking amazing. So yeah. I see that we've got like so many people that are joining the live. Thank you so much for everyone who's joining the live. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be bringing us to our close. And I think yeah. we've, covered, we've covered so many things that for me are important. Like okay. speaking about rebreathers, I mean, yeah. I, don't know a lot of, I don't know a lot of black and brown people who have rebreathing who are working the rebreather space. I don't know that. And I wanted us to chat about that because, you know, some things you don't know about. And when someone speaks about it, it comes into your viewpoint. It comes into yeah. your access world. And you, you then start to engage and become curious. And I think that's why these talks are important. You know, guardians of the reef, what does it mean when our passion meets purpose? You know, and what can we do in our, in our ways in which we engage with the sea, whether we are in the sea, whether we are on the beach, whether yeah. we're still reading and dreaming about the ocean, and yeah. you know, looking at invasive species, you know, you know, we we've had a big chat, and I'm I'm so happy that we're able to cover a lot of the topics that we're able to. And I'm gonna ask you one thing as I'll close: What would you want to share with this community? Maybe that's one. But so I often say it can either be advice. Um, mm -hmm. or something that's on your heart to share or or a tip you know be it if it's a tip about lionfish or a tip about rebreathers uh tell us i would just encourage everybody um that's watching this on the live or on the replay that's you know watching you know zandi and myself deliver this message and again zandi i think you're, you're at the core it's, you know representation is, is a really big big deal i would say like don't don't let anything stand in your way of achieving whatever you want it, want it to be. And it takes bold action to um, put yourself out there and put yourself forward, you know, be at the table where you're the only one that looks like you be at the, on the boat and you're the only one that looks like you be in a course, whether it's yoga, free diving, scuba diving, um, a nutrition class to eat, you know, plant-based. If you're the only one that looks like you, you know, take it, take it in, push through. And like I did, Try to create it, and like Zandi's doing now, you know, take that bold leap of faith and action and create a platform and join other platforms that share in your vision, vision and mission. You know, right now, we're, this is a Bermuda, uh, Bermuda and South Africa connection. Um, and there are people out there doing some really amazing work, but it does take um, a huge, like, build action. And I would just say, like, always improve, always evolve, never give up. And um, yeah, passion to purpose, that's, that's critical. Um, and yeah, and to all you guys out there in the viewing audience, um, I got a plug, uh, check me out at weldonwade.com slash hello. Check out my Instagram feed here, I'm on Facebook, I'm all across social, crushing it to the best of my ability and just trying to spread love um, in Bermuda and across the globe. And there's a lot going on. We haven't talked about my job, which is with the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program. Um, you know, we're, we're, try, we're gonna be protecting 20% of Bermuda's EEZ, and that's a whole nother thing. We've got a launch coming up September 17th, which is online. There's a virtual island summit event next week that I'm a part of. Um, 
And maybe Sandy and I can go live another time and do another deeper dive into some specifics. I'm happy to jump back on Z whenever you need me. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it's and, and with the rebreathers, I know we covered a lot of that. Um, yeah, don't think that you need to own one to get the knowledge. You know what I mean? You can get books, but you don't need to own a library, right? Just get the knowledge um, and it, it all it all ties together and be diverse. Don't silo yourself into a specific time discipline. My, my most memorable experiences have been on the surface of the ocean, on the surface. <laughs> so Instagram's about a cut Thank you so much, Walden. <laughs>